I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Lonnie Koss, Senior Advisor to the Center for American Defense Studies and a Senior Fellow at the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. Dr. Koss' experience includes past roles as Senior Policy Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Special Assistant to the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force, Senior Mentor to the USAF Project Checkmate, Director of the Cyber Task Force, Professor of Military Strategy and Operations at the National War College, and more recently as a Senior Vice President at CACI International and a member of the Board of Visitors at the Air Force Institute of Technology. Dr. Koss is a graduate of the National War College, National Defense University, holds a PhD from the Kaplan School of Economics and Political Science, and a joint PhD from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. So before we get started, I want to do a quick disclaimer. The views expressed in this interview are the opinions of Dr. Koss alone and do not represent the views or opinions of her employer or the United States government. So Lonnie, welcome back. It has been a very long time. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. And just to add to this disclaimers, I'm no longer with the Mitchell Institute. Ah, I'm okay. fully retired. Fully retired. Fully well, retired. To, you know, to, to add to my intro, I want to thank you for your career of service. You have served you. our country so many years in so many different roles. Thank you so thank you. much. Thank you. So I want to jump right into Operation Al-Aqsa Flood. On October 7th, Hamas began a coordinated surprise offensive on Israel that included a barrage of over 3,000 rockets, along with ground attacks by 2,500 Palestinian militants who breached the Gaza-Israel barrier and massacred over 1,400 civilians in neighboring Israeli communities. Uh, what can you tell me about that? I think we were all taken by surprise. How do yes. you kind of... How did you learn about this and what were your impressions there? Well, I, like most Americans, I learned about it on television. Um, and it was just the most horrific experience. In truth, I never expected to see anything like that. What most people don't realize is that Israel does not occupy Gaza. It withdrew from Gaza in 2005. For the two years after that, till 2007, the Palestinian National Authority, which controls the West Bank, controlled Gaza. It got kicked out by Hamas. The second thing that most people don't realize is that the attack was not on so-called occupied territory. It was within Israel's internationally recognized borders, the so-called Green Line. And the victims were among the most peace-loving, progressive, pro territorial solution and two state solution that you can find anywhere in the Middle East. And I think that's probably the greatest and unrecognized tragedy because whatever besides wanton murder and, and sheer brutality was in Hamas's mind, they set the course of any peaceful solution back decades. There is no one in Israel right now that is thinking in terms of anything but totally destroying Hamas. Yeah, yeah, no, I completely understand where you're coming from. 
this is such a touchy subject and uh, you know and, and it's an emerging story it is all so new and so emotionally powerful so the, the questions that i wrote i've really tried to go from current news reports and wikipedia and other things along those lines you know and that way i'm not interjecting my own opinions which may or may not be educated into it i'm trying to go sure. based on facts and then we can rely on your expertise because again you have so many career you know so many years of experience in government the media is calling this israel's september 11th but retired General David Petraeus was quoted by CBS News Sunday morning as calling it far worse than 9-11 and saying this is the equivalent of the U.S. having experienced over 40,000 losses rather than right. the 3,000 terrible losses that we sustained in the 9-11 attacks. What are your thoughts on the comparison between the Hamas attack and September 11th? <sighs> So that is the comparison that immediately comes to mind, but both in terms of the absolute surprise, the failure to anticipate something like that, as well as the scope of the casualties. And my friend General Petraeus is exactly right, proportionately to the size of the population, you are talking about somewhere between 40 and 50,000 people killed during one day. But in many ways, it's worse than September 11, not only in terms of the number of casualties. September 11 was horrifying because no one ever expected terrorists with box cutters to, to hijack American airliners and fly them into buildings. What we have seen in Israel in, on October 7 was in many ways worse because of the directness and sheer brutality of the attack. It could be just me, but there is a difference when you personally hands-on kill, murder, rape, dismember, take hostage, men, women, and children, you know, in the middle of the holiday. So dead is dead, and, and casualties are casualties, but the manner in which it happened, I, I, I'm trying to draw a good analogy, and I can't, but there is a personal nature to what happened in Southern Israel that you did not see on September 11. Now, in terms of the outrage, it's very similar. And any American who is trying to draw moral equivalence, you know, Israel has been the occupying power and since 1967, and, and you know, it's somehow in the broader scope of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, ask yourself how you felt on the evening of September 11. You weren't thinking about America's policy toward the Middle East or America's global posture. You were simply outraged. Yeah. And, and that is, you know, what I kind of expected from most Americans. The narrative changed really quickly. So we went from unequivocal support for Israel, unequivocal condemnation of Hamas, to this moral equivalence, which just 
went off the deep end after the tragedy in the hospital in Gaza, where the truth is almost irrelevant. I mean, Israel presented compelling evidence. There is compelling evidence that US intelligence uncovered and publicized. It doesn't matter. The emotions are such that the narrative returned to its predictable cause. Israel is the bad guy, it's the aggressor, it's the Goliath, and the Palestinians are, you know, the victims with the slingshot. It doesn't match the current situation, but that is the convenient narrative that everybody kind of defaulted to. And people almost don't remember how it started. Well, I want to make another comparison between September 11th and this attack as well. The World Trade Center was a terrorist target well before September 11th destroyed it. Right. And Israel has been a target for decades. In both cases, preventative measures have been in place. Is it fair to say that for a determined adversary, there's no way to truly prevent terrorism from a defensive perspective alone? I, I would put it a little bit differently. Any defensive system needs to be effective 100% of the time. A determined terrorist needs to be successful exactly once. So you immediately have an imbalance between offense and defense. The fact that Israel has been attacked before led to the establishment of layered defenses and Arguably, Israel got very complacent behind these defenses. Mm. It's not like these kind of an attack could not have been anticipated. I just watched, and I would urge your viewers to, it's available online, so memory, the Middle East, um, research Institute, um, which follows Palestinian and Arab media. If you watch graduation ceremonies at Gazan kindergartens, starting in about 2010, you will see children enacting precisely what had happened. Breaking out of Gaza, cutting holes in the fence, in the electrified fence, and electrified, I mean, not that electricity is running through it, but it's an electronic fence that should be able oh, to detect okay. a fox coming across. Going house to house, killing people and taking hostages. So the intent has been public if you just wanted to see it. Now, most people blow it off as aspirational. It's not going to happen. So when you look at the potential for any surprise, you need to look at an assessment of capability and intent. And in this particular case, even if Israel correctly assessed the intent, it grossly underestimated the capability. Same arguably with Al-Qaeda. It declared war on the United States, not once, but twice. Yeah. We didn't listen. Because we assumed that while there is a declaration of hostile intent, there is no capability to make good on that threat. 
And therefore, when the attacks happened, everybody was stunned. But remember, the reaction in the immediate aftermath was dismantle Al-Qaeda. Not any different than the Israeli stated political objective of go and dismantle Hamas, which, like in the case of Al-Qaeda, is easier said than done. Well, in this case, in terms of preventative measures, and again, you'd mentioned layered defenses, I want to touch on Iron Dome briefly. This is the anti-missile system that right. Israel has said intercepts between 90 and 97 percent of incoming rockets. Uh, this appears to have been very successful in this case, so we'd call it a success story. However, each Iron Dome missile costs between 40000 and 60000 U.S. dollars, and the Hamas rockets were reportedly improvised water pipes that cost- Some of them. Three hundred and fifty. Some of them. Some of them. Okay. Three hundred and fifty to five hundred dollars. Some are much, much more sophisticated. But then I believe this calculus of offense and defense is interesting, but ultimately not compelling. The United States used million dollar missiles against a Toyota Technical. Yeah. So the calculus between how much a technologically advanced power invests to deal with ultimately low tech and off the shelf systems is irrelevant. And, and I, I think it's a distraction. The other point being that the Iron Dome, like any defensive system, can be easily overwhelmed. So it can deal with barrages, but limited. Okay. And, and what Hamas has so devilishly figured out that the missile system can be overwhelmed. But again, what happened on October 7 was not just another missile barrage. The, the victims of the surprise took it as another missile barrage and left themselves in safe homes where they were victims of slaughter. Yeah. So you know, when you do what you are accustomed to doing in the face of something fundamentally different, usually, most often, almost always, it doesn't work. So this was unique because the rocket barrage was the first volley in a very well orchestrated land, air, and sea attack, which was not anticipated. Rockets were that what Israel's defenses were intended to deal with. Well, I want to get into the, Israel's response to the initial attacks. Uh, Israel immediately launched airstrikes on Gaza targets and imposed a blockade that cut off food, right. water, electricity, and fuel supplies. Over 2,750 Palestinians have reportedly been killed, and the United Nations reports that nearly half of Gaza's population has been internally displaced. Has Israel responded appropriately so far, in your opinion? And will this lead to the humanitarian crisis that we're now reading about in many headlines? The humanitarian crisis has already happened. You know, we are now on day, what, 11? Yeah. By my count, there is no way to respond humanely to 
what transpired. I mean, there is not. And just like the United States response to the 9-11 attacks, it's by definition when the technologically superior power uses air power, so far only no ground invasion yet. And I sincerely hope it does not happen. How do you deal with a terrorist organization that is embedded among civilians? And Hamas has been known to deliberately place its command centers, its weapons manufacturing, its installations in masks, in schools, in hospitals, in UN um, aid organizations. You're talking about a very densely populated area probably one of the most densely populated areas in the world. You know, the width of the Gaza Strip is about five miles and the length is about 25 and it has over 2 million people. I mean, just think about the density of the population. A lot of the buildings are high rises that what you're seeing toppled on television, the Hamas infrastructure is underground in tunnels. I'm not sure that the air campaign, as ferocious as it is, as it has to be, is actually destroying the Hamas infrastructure, which is pretty safe underground. Well, since you touched on the population density, uh, the international community has sent billions of dollars in aid to the Gaza Strip to provide relief for the, the 2 million Palestinians that you've already said are living there. Uh, between 2014 and 2020, UN agencies spent nearly $4.5 billion in Gaza, including $600 million in 2020 alone. Has that aid been subverted to support terrorism? And f should future aid be contingent on the Palestinians removing Hamas and recognizing Israel as a legitimate government, just as the United Nations itself does? Money is always fungible. So when you send assistance to a territory governed by a terrorist organization, a designated terrorist organization, Hamas, dedicated by its charter to the eradication of the state of Israel. You know, the fair question is, what do you expect is going to happen? So of course, the aid has been subverted. Sending money is not the wise thing to do. And, and you know that even materials such as cement and building materials and water pipes have been subverted to be used as weapons. And nobody is supervising how the money is being used. So it's, it's a conundrum because you are dealing with a genuine humanitarian crisis. On the other hand, you are dealing with an implacable terrorist organization. At this point, to me, the quid pro quo should be hostages for humanitarian assistance. It's when you listen to the media, it almost seems like the hostages, about 200 of them, have been completely forgotten. 
men, women, children, Americans, other nationals, Israelis, they in Gaza. Nobody knows if they are alive, well, there is no contact. They are being used as human shields, undoubtedly, as are innocent Palestinians. Again, when you are talking about a terrorist organization intermingled with innocent civilians, it is impossible to sort it out. So I understand the rage, the need to retaliate. I mean, it's natural. I was at the Pentagon after September 11. I remember how everybody felt and, and, and the desire to, especially in Israel's case, to reestablish deterrence the necessity to reestablish deterrence. I mean, no nation is going to allow that. I mean, imagine cartels from Mexico crossed into California and killed 40,000 Californians. I mean, the, the outrage would be incomprehensible. But you are dealing with a situation which does not allow for discrimination in the good sense, in the ethical sense of civilian and terrorists, mm. and proportionality in terms of the justifiable retaliation. We talked in the past about war crimes and the ethics of war. It is probably the most difficult environment to apply those. Yeah, because of the mixed population. Right, right, and right. And, and the tiny packed area. Well, so on the 18th, President Joe Biden urged Israel not to make the same mistakes today that were made responding to September 11th. Yep. Um, but the 1988 Hamas covenant calls for the destruction of Israel. Right. So if the U.S. hadn't dismantled Al Qaeda after 9-11, there probably would have been more attacks. That was the feeling at the time. Can Israel hope for some kind of peace in the future without removing Hamas from power? I don't believe so. I don't believe Hamas can be reformed. Now, you draw the analogy to Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda didn't want to destroy the United States. It wanted the United States to get out of the Middle East. Fundamental difference. Yeah. So while the 9-11 attacks were on U.S. territory, the stated objective was not to return the United States to Native Americans, which is the stated objective of Hamas. Hamas does not recognize a two-state solution. And again, I can't emphasize enough the fact that the attack was on an area of Israel which is within Israel proper, meaning the Green Line, the internationally recognized borders, from a territory that Israel withdrew from. So the question in the mind of every Israeli is, okay, so let's say we unilaterally withdraw from the West Bank. What guarantees that the same thing does not happen? In many ways, 
and and again, this is the tragedy that I see there. It reinforced their worst nightmares and the most anti-peace narratives within Israel. So I firmly believe that the attacks set the cause of a two-state solution back decades. Now, Hamas does not accept a two-state solution. The peace process has been more bound for a very long time, unfortunately. Reconstituting it now, I don't think anyone in Israel is even thinking in those terms. Frankly, what I think the president had in mind, don't get involved in a 20-year war. Don't invade two countries, which is what the United States has done after September 11, and fight there for 20 years. The fundamental difference, again, is the distance. Uh, the United States did not border Iraq or Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia, for that matter, from which Al Qaeda originated. So the the statement by the president, I believe, was think about how this is supposed to end. The problem, Tim, is, as you know, that humans are humans and even decision makers are human. And at this point, the rage is such that talking or restraint is laughable. Yeah. Because this is the worst single day attack on Jews in their homeland since the Holocaust. And everybody in Israel feels that. It's it's not something that happened overseas, which again makes the 9-11 attacks similar, but different in the sense that your decision space about what to do about it is fundamentally different. You attack over there, thousands of miles away, as opposed to right on your own borders. Remember, Israel took about 48 hours to completely get rid of all the infiltrators on its territory. And quite frankly, you don't even know If it has, I mean, people could have gone to ground and are still there. I mean, there is no easy way to distinguish who is who. They all look the same. A lot of Israelis speak Arabic. Some Palestinians speak Hebrew. A lot of them walk in Israel. It's a unique situation that is hard for Americans to understand because of the proximity. Well, there's another aspect to this also that I'd like to touch on, which is the potential involvement of Iran. Uh, White House National Security Spokesman John Kirby recently noted that Iran has long supported Hamas and other terrorist networks throughout the region with resources and training. Iran has also been supplying kamikaze drones to Russia for use in Ukraine. So I'm wondering, number one, should Israel be holding Iran at least partially responsible for enabling these attacks? And then number two, do you think that this is setting the United States and Iran on a future collision course for war as a result? Unfortunately, yes. 
so the ties between let's backtrack iran is a terrorist sponsoring state has been for a very long time you know when i was at the pentagon we were often joking and and it was kind of gallows humor that we are in iraq because of a misspelling and we should have been in iran you know just one one letter of difference and somebody mistyped the order iran has more american blood on its hands than any other country on the planet you know going back to the hostage crisis during the carter administration going back to the bombing of the marine barracks in beirut hezbollah orchestrated by iran iran is sponsoring both hezbollah in lebanon and hamas in gaza little interesting hamas is a sunni organization iran is a shia state but it's an alliance of convenience and hamas is right there on the israeli border hezbollah compared to hamas uh, you know i don't want to use the unfortunate statement of former president obama that isis is the junior varsity but hezbollah is truly the varsity compared to hamas it is much more disciplined it's much better armed it's much more numerous and it has longer range weapons again within range of the sovereign territory of Israel nothing to do with the west bank see people in the united states kind of trying to explain the cycle of violence um or talking about israeli occupation of palestine there is no occupation in gaza there is no occupation in lebanon Hezbollah took over Lebanon and and is running it as a terrorist platform if they engage and open a second front the situation for Israel is going to get extremely dire fighting a two front war for any country is difficult it's especially difficult for a small country like israel where its civilians are very much in the way so if hamas sends missiles and they much better than hezbollah meant um into israel you talking about the port of haifa which is in the way major chemical processing facilities uh industrial sites you're talking about thousands of casualties you know within israel proper not something that israel can allow to happen um i sincerely hope hezbollah decides to set it out I don't ascribe that kind of restrained or restrained to a terrorist organization it's actually an opportunity for them to show relevance and and to engage um the US forces in the area are not there to help Israel deal with Hamas they are there to deter Iran going back to your question the collision calls with the United States Iran has been getting very aggressive for a long time 
you know, against U.S. shipping in the Straits, um, in the Strait of Hormuz, for example. All it takes is an incident and you're lighting up a spark. Remember the USS Cole was anchored in the port of Aden in Yemen. A little fishing boat killed a lot of Americans. Iran yeah. sponsored. So again, Iran has more American blood on its hands than any any other country. I do believe it exercises control over both Hezbollah and Hamas. What nobody knows is the extent of its control. In other words, can if Iran, let's say, tells them don't do anything, are they going to listen? Nobody knows the answer to this question. I mean, the president was very unequivocal in telling Iran and Hezbollah, don't. There are so many questions that come into this, and I, I'm going off my questions list a little bit, but um, a 2013 BBC World Service poll indicated that 87% of Americans have a negative view of Iran and a 2018 Pew poll uh, showed that 39% of Americans say that limiting the power and influence of Iran should be a top foreign policy priority. Uh, in contrast, a 2019 survey by Iran poll showed that 86% of Iranians have a similarly unfavorable view of the United States. So I, I think part of it is, again, in terms of this potential collision course, uh, the the negative perception is already there. But then one of my concerns also is this continued escalation, right? I mean, again, right. uh, uh, Iran has started um, uh, apparently selling kamikaze drones. That's an escalation. Um, Hamas has escalated. My worry is what happens if someone decides to escalate to like chemical, nuclear, or biological, if they can get their hands on it? You're talking about World War Three, Yeah. You know, and arguably, this is where we are. You know, the opening phases of World War Three, When we talked about Ukraine, I draw the analogy to the Spanish Civil War. We just moved the clock to 1939. And I don't say it lightly. Lonnie, on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, as Tim. well As well as for your remarkable career of service to our thank nation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me close, if it's okay, by anticipate by asking what you anticipate seeing in the headlines in the very near future. We're seeing more about Iran. Uh, the Ukraine war continues to progress. There is a lot going on. Uh, this recent attack has complicated things even further. What do you expect to see in the next month or two? So let me give you the worst case scenario. And that is China seizing an opportunity to make an aggressive move against Taiwan. If you believe in the true axis of evil, you know, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, there is a potential for escalation there. I sincerely hope it doesn't, it doesn't happen, but it's something that we need to watch. I don't think Putin orchestrated what is happening in the Middle East, but the timing for him couldn't have been better. Nobody is talking about Ukraine anymore. All eyes are turned to the Middle East. For the United States supplying to allies at the same time, 
is difficult, not impossible, but difficult. You know, the stocks of munitions were already running low with a war in Ukraine going for a year and what, seven months, if my math is correct. Now supplying Israel, which is going to run out of precision munitions pretty quickly. So everything is stretched extremely thin and you're looking at a tender box that I have not seen in my lifetime. So I have never been that pessimistic and that worried about how this ends. In the near term, I believe Israel will go on the ground into Gaza. I wish it didn't have to. But if the political objective is given by the government of Israel is to dismantle Hamas, you cannot do it from the air. So a ground invasion is almost inevitable, which brings this whole spiral that we were talking about because Iran said, if Israel gets engaged on the ground, this is where they're going to react. So Iran obviously is trying to deter a ground invasion. I truly hope not to see a ground invasion. It's awful, it's atrocious, and it's going to be exceedingly bloody for both sides. I just don't see any other viable options. I mean, it's not like there is a peace-loving Palestinian government in the wings waiting for Hamas to fall and it's going to take over in negotiations with Israel or going to start. And even if they started negotiating, what are you going to negotiate over? Gaza, there is no occupation in Gaza. So there is no Palestinian legitimate claim from Gaza. Does so that make take, sense? It, it does. It does. And, and my takeaway, actually, from today's conversation is one word, 1939, which is yes. something I fear as well. Yeah. Yeah. Lonnie, thank Unfortunately. you Unfortunately. Thank, Thank you, you Tim. Again. Thank so you so much for your time today. Thanks. Thanks. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Tim.